Hi, I'm Dr. Ben Newman. I've studied coronaviruses for over 20 years, and I don't know, I'm going to try to answer your questions. All right, let's go. Uh, next question is from Diego. What's up, Diego? How are you doing? All right. Um, uh, let's see. Diego says, thank you for uh, the work that you do. Hey, sure. Yeah, uh, let's see. So as we approach the elections, we've seen more and more statements talking about promising therapeutics against COVID-19 uh, that are yet to be proven effective. Yeah, I believe you have hit the nail squarely on the head. Promising is, uh, is quite a word. I mean, it means that somebody somewhere, you know, this is their baby and they are absolutely convinced it's going to really amount to something out there in the world. And uh, promising also means that there's no direct evidence right now that it is uh, that's what's going to happen. It is... Um, it's a word that conveys hope, but not uh, uh, any sort of actionable, realistic meaning yet. Yeah, but may maybe someday. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the question is, uh, can you tell us more about what are the standards and data needed to prove a drug actually helps treat COVID-19? Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I don't know. That's, yeah, it's like a whole course, right? <laughs> And uh, I'm probably not the guy to teach that course. <laughs> yeah, I know some things, but not everything. Yeah. Um, so, but we can we can do the uh, the sort of quick run through. So the way it is set up right now, so you would not even consider testing out a drug in humans unless it has been an absolute star at an earlier stage. And so the earlier stages are it's got to absolutely destroy the virus or do something amazing uh, in the laboratory. Um, or you've got to have a really good idea that this drug is known from you know various other studies, and you cite all the papers with those studies, that it takes away something that the virus needs, or that uh, look we made a model and it docks perfectly, you know, right into one of the virus proteins and should just shut this thing down. You've got to have a real good rationale before you ever come close to uh, a human. Uh, in in most modern studies, there there's still some people that are able to do studies based on sort of hunches. They almost always do not work out, but um, it's within the realm of what uh, we're allowed to do. Uh, these are generally going to happen um, uh, with doctors in hospitals, and they are trying stuff out, which is essentially uh, the job to some extent when there is not a uh, guaranteed uh, treatment that's going to work, which is kind of the situation that we're in right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so what's the actual benchmark? Um, yeah, the benchmark is statistical. Yeah, how disappointing an answer is that, right? Um, the benchmark is that you're going to do uh, certain statistical tests and show that there's a meaningful difference between a group that gets the drug and a group that does not get the drugs. The other keys to running a study like that and getting results out that we can actually use around the world, you want to make sure that your participants are not are, are somewhat diverse. Uh, so. Not just all men age 50 to 55 from, I don't know, uh, yeah, Kenosha, Wisconsin or something like that. You got to you gotta broaden it out a little bit and, uh, yeah, try and get something. I mean, the ideal would be you would run some uh, uh, sort of a quick genetic test. You would read out uh, like the same markers they would read out to check if you are a bone marrow donor. And you would start out with a diverse population of uh, people with different immune systems. Because you can't always tell what genes are running a person's immune system based on the way they look. Actually, usually you can't tell anything about it. <laughs> um, yeah, which is why they don't just uh, say, "Oh, you you look, you look like you'll do. Let's let's transplant this organ and see if it uh, gets rejected or not." Yeah, that that would be bad. That would not be uh, evidence-based medicine. So, you want a double-blinded uh, trial. So the patients should not know which drug they're getting. You, you want to make the treatments look, feel, sound as similar as possible. The doctors that are giving the treatments or nurses or whoever's doing it should not know which treatment they are giving to the different groups. This information should only be known to an independent uh, group of watchers that are crunching the statistics watching the trial, and if anything bad happens to uh, the people in the trial, then they are running out there and checking and saying, whoa, let's pause the trial, like has happened in several of the vaccine trials, until we can figure out what has gone on and uh, then, uh, yeah, sort it out. And then the answer is going to be, if you can make a meaningful difference in the group that got the treatment, 
um, compared to the group that did not get the treatment. And if the meaningful difference is good, yeah, <laughs> not bad, obviously. Um, and if everything about those groups was similar enough that you can say that, yeah, these are just two random sections of society. It's like two different realities, one in which you got the drug, one in which you didn't. We know we can't do that exactly because everybody's a little different and you've only got the one reality, but that's what a good experiment is trying to do. You would also want good numbers of participants. And for a disease like COVID-19, where you've got, let's say, a 1% or 2% fatality rate, you're going to want to have at least something like a 1,000 people in each of those groups, the control group and the treatment group. So like minimum 2,000 people with the disease roughly the same time um, enrolled in your study, not just you know out there in the world. And yeah, recruiting enough people to get decent data like that is a challenge. There are specialists uh, who are really good at doing this, and thank goodness for people like that. Um, but uh, yeah, that, I am not one of those people for sure. <laughs> that is, they have a, a certain set of skills, and I just I don't have it. That's fine. <laughs> Um, and so if you meet all those criteria and then at the end, when they unblind it, basically pull the uh, you know, little uh, blindfold off of uh, patient and doctor and everybody and crunch the statistics, if you can show that there's a meaningful difference, statistically meaningful, you've got to run it through certain tests and it's not, you know, maybe you, you were able to uh, stop uh, people from dying, but you wouldn't just look at dying, you would look at everything. You would look at um, how many people had to go on a ventilator, how many people progressed from mild to moderate or mild to moderate to serious uh, COVID. You'd look at how much oxygen people needed on average. You'd look at um, everything about how the people were when they came into the hospital, because they were probably already showing some symptoms before you can recruit them into your study. Um, yeah, and uh, you get real smart people to go over all that data and then you present all of this um, both in public so that mm, schmoes like me can read it uh, and then also to the um, uh, regulatory body, something like the FDA or the equivalent in uh, whatever country we're talking about. And yeah, with, um, with all that finally in place, then yes, you, you can be at least reasonably sure that the um, treatment, drug, vaccine, whatever is going to work. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to work for everyone doesn't mean it's going to work in super old people who were probably not in that study. It doesn't mean it's going to work in children who were probably not in that study. And both of those for ethical reasons because they're a little bit delicate or because they have a long life ahead of them and drugs sometimes do unpredictable things in children. But uh, this, is, uh, this is the idea. Yeah. So it's a pretty high bar to actually get a drug all the way through um, all the clinical trials uh, to approval. And uh, yeah, it takes a long time. So um, phase one and two trials, this is also in the question, how long does it take? Phase one and two trials, we've seen those come out in something like uh, two to three months uh, for like a combined phase one and two. That, that has happened. And that's, that's about as quickly as you can do it. For phase three, there are usually multiple arms of a phase three where they're going to be trying it in older people, in people with mild COVID, in people with just severe COVID. Each one, they're trying to get enough people, that sort of 1,000 people in each group, to try and be able to tell um, whether or not the uh, intervention, whatever it is, is having the desired effect. And uh, yeah, yeah. Then once all of those come out, then they'll present the data and either go for piecemeal, just say, can you approve it for this use? And then you know, in a couple of weeks, we'll say, can you approve it for this other use? Or they'll get it all together and say, look, it's, you know, kicked butt in every single study. Let's just, can't we just, uh, <laughs> you know, get blanket approval to use this? And uh, yeah, the regulatory body will then consider it and uh, make their decision based on how strong is the data, what tests did they do, what tests did they not do. You may send them back, just like in peer review in a journal, and say, hey, yeah, buddy, yeah, you didn't look at a particular population of cells that we think now are really important. We may not have even known at the time. Go back and look at that, tell us what you found, and then we'll think about it. Yeah. So there's a ton of uh, work, so many person hours uh, that goes into uh, actually getting a drug through uh, approval. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a giant job, and I'm glad there are people out there doing that job right now. Yeah. 
So thanks very much. That's like the, the short version of the answer anyway. And it's already 10 minutes long. And I don't think anybody wants the you know, five hour version of the answer. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like I said, I may not be the person uh, even to give the five hour version. You probably want somebody that's actually done one of these uh, firsthand. Yeah, I would say. So anyway, thanks very much. Great question. Yeah. And uh, this has been Ask Dr. Ben.